ahead and get started because the uh, opening of this is um, there's going to be a bit of housekeeping. But good morning, everyone, and welcome to Advent with Ebenezer, an exploration of Charles Dickens's uh, beloved novella, A Christmas Carol. And we are so glad you have all joined. I could tell by the uh, pace of registration uh, that this really um, hit home. It resonated with a whole lot of us that we were um, attracted to the idea of diving maybe a little bit deeper into a story that we know well or think we know well mm -hmm. and is uh, a, a treasured part of our um, uh, season uh, leading up to Christmas or during Christmas. And I think for many of us forms uh, our imagination around what a, um, an idyllic kind of Christmas is like. This has left deep impressions upon our spiritual imaginations, I think. Mm -hmm. And so we are grateful for the opportunity to dive into it, beginning as we are only halfway through November, uh, two, uh, two full weeks ahead of the start of Advent, and yet needing these extra two weeks because we'll take a break next Sunday. Uh, it's the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And for those who will be traveling, that is often a time of travel, a uh, time when uh, formation classes are more poorly attended than other weeks. And so we will take a break next week and then resume on the 29th and go those four Sundays of Advent um, uh, so that we can spend five weeks exploring the five staves or stanzas, I guess you would say, um, in um, an older form of language of these, this, uh, this carol, this tale. And so we'll spend five weeks on this and it is, um, I think, going to be a lot of fun. Uh, before I introduce uh, our participants and our leaders, um, and one in particular, uh, I want to just remind everyone this is a webinar, and so you're only going to see the four faces of the four presenters. You're only going to see us and whatever slides we share, and so I have a couple of slides to share uh, um, here as we begin, just as I lay some groundwork, um, but otherwise you'll just see our faces, and, um, and that's okay. Use the chat to put information or feedback uh, that you have, links to different resources that you might recommend for others to enjoy, um, or just general comments. Use the Q&A if you have a specific question. So the Q&A helps us um, parse out those specific questions so we can keep track of those and try to answer them as we go along, okay? So use the Q&A to ask questions, use the um, chat to uh, comment and offer feedback. This is recorded. So we will be posting it and making it available for future weeks. So if you miss a week, that's great. We can figure it out. Um, it will be um, sharing it on our uh, Transfiguration Facebook page. But joining Mother Rebecca and me uh, for these two weeks are two wonderful people. One is more known to, I think, most of you, Dr. Roy Heller, our uh, um, uh, beloved uh, mentor and teacher in the Hebrew Bible, Many of you who are joining this class have joined uh, Dr. Roy Heller for his several year uh, <laughs> slow and patient journey through the Old Testament. Uh, and he is a um, professor of Hebrew Bible, professor of Old Testament at Perkins here in Dallas and a long member of our church and a former vestry member too, indeed. Uh, but it is his custom, as I learned a number of years ago to read a Christmas Carol each holiday season. And uh, so um, several years ago, it planted the seed in my head that I was going to ask Roy to teach a class on a Christmas carol, which is not necessarily his domain of scholarship, but is something that he is um, uh, 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 formed by and loves. And so always knew that I wanted to ask him to do this. And then Dr. Robert Patton came to Transfiguration a couple of years ago. He and his husband, Seth, uh, moved here. And uh, uh, over time of learning about them and learning about Bob's areas of um, scholarship, came to understand that, um, that he is a Dickens scholar. And here, uh, here we have this marvelous treasure and a person whose um, uh, career as a historian has um, helped him dive deeply into the life of Dickens and his writing, and, and including this particular story. And then you put them together, put him together with Roy Heller, and you've got the makings of a great conversation. Um, and Rebecca and I just get to sort of like be flies on the wall, I think, as, uh, as such as it is. <laughs> well, 
this story is so um, uh, ingrained, imbued with the themes of this season we are going to begin that we thought that we would use it as our advential exploration. So I'm gonna um, uh, talk briefly here at the beginning um, about some of the core themes of Advent because we're gonna pull those themes in as we're exploring the first stave today and the rest of the story as we go along. But I just wanna sort of lay out those sort of core, um, core Advential themes. For those of you who are Episcopalian or have been around churches that honor this season, these themes will probably be somewhat familiar to you. But um, uh, for those who are newer to, to our tradition or, or to the observance of Advent, some of these might be unfamiliar. Um, before I do that, Bob, Roy, Rebecca, anything you want to say as we get started? I, I have long said that if the Church Universal ever decided to open up the canon again, then right after Revelation should be a Christmas carol. Um, <laughs> I, I, I withdraw that though. Um, I don't believe that anymore. I don't think it should be right after Revelation. I think it should replace Revelation. <laughs> but anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Lovely. Oh, Lovely. that's fantastic. <laughs> you, and, you and Martin Luther, my, uh, perhaps, uh, <laughs> exactly. sort of take, take, take Revelation out and yeah, find something the, more yeah, fitting. Yeah. It's yeah. much better, yeah. Bob, anything you want to say before I, I um, explore some of the themes of Advent? We're going to kick it over to you in a bit as you give us some background on this story in Dickens's life. No, I'm I'm really in, <laughs> alongside three people who know much more than I. So please go ahead. <laughs> well, we're we're excited to hear from you in just a bit. But um, as we get started, I want to everybody. I just want to um, lay a little bit of groundwork of what Advent is about. So. As we are looking at A Christmas Carol and enjoying the story once again, um, a story that really does have so many layers of richness um, in its language and, uh, and tale, um, as we put it together with Advent, it helps um, us to remember what Advent is all about. So just a few things, um, uh, themes of Advent, and I am grateful um, for the uh, compliment on the font. I worked hard to find a good font, so it um, <laughs> seemed, seemed necessary, seemed important. Advent. Advent, if you remember, comes from the um, Latin word adventus, which means coming. So in Advent, we remember the ways in which Christ has come and will come again. So we remember the first advent um, for which we prepare in the season in a practical way. So the weeks leading up to Christmas in a practical way are the time when we are preparing to celebrate Christmas, right? The, the feast of the incarnation. So advent is the time in which we remember Christ's coming. We prepare to celebrate uh, the, the nativity of Christ, his coming long ago. But it is perhaps even more specifically focused upon the eventual and one day return or coming again of Christ at the end of time. And so that's why we hear so much in the readings already in our Sunday lectionary readings um, for the last several weeks and will continue um, to um, pull those themes through for the next several weeks when the scriptures refer to in particular the prophets, but also Paul. Um, the Apostle Paul write about the day of the Lord. What they're talking about is the eschaton, the end time when Christ returns, when Christ comes again. So the word advent is from the word for coming, and in that we are re referencing the once uh, uh, upon uh, a time, I guess you could say, to pull in um, a Christmas carol, uh, Christ's entry into the word, world, his coming and his eventual coming again. But we also remember the ways, and it is important to remember the ways in which Christ comes to us even now. Christ comes to us um, as expressed as we will hear in next Sunday's um, uh, gospel story. Christ comes to us in the persons of the vulnerable and the stranger. Christ also comes to us, we believe, mystically in the sacrament, um, that Christ is made known to us and revealed to us in the sacrament. So it's this theme in Advent of past present, and future laid on top of one another. In Advent, all of those times um, are um, interwoven together, and we are aware of um, the ways in which time is interwoven. Um, uh, in, we, we are made more aware of it. We are reminded of it. And of course, 
that theme is going to come up as we move into a Christmas Carol. I, I don't have to feed you that. You, you can understand how that theme is going to pull directly into a Christmas Carol. <clears throat> the second major um, idea of Advent is this notion of judgment and repentance, that in Christ's return, at the, at the end day, day with a capital D, that there will be judgment, that God will judge the living and the dead, and that in that judgment, all will be laid bare, that um, everything will be revealed for what it is, um, with the um, full and transparent truth, honesty of all things. And so tied to judgment is this um, uh, notion of repentance, that in anticipation of judgment, we are invited to amend our lives, to change our ways, to turn from that which is opposed to God back to that which is of or for God. And so that's why John the Baptist is the prophet we hear most, John the Baptist and Isaiah, uh, but John the Baptist specifically, we, will, we hear every year in our gospel stories in Advent because John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus and the prophet of repentance. And he preached repentance um, with great fire and zeal. And so we hear that, all right? Um, Advent is a season when our minds are, uh, are put on the eventual judgment of God and therefore invited into a spirit of repentance and amendment. We think about repentance a lot in Lent, less so in Advent, and yet when you think about the eventual return of God, it, it is intended to evoke in us a transformation of our lives. So judgment and repentance is big. Obviously, we're going to get into that with our Christmas carol, right? Three related themes um, that go together, anticipation, preparation, and readiness. So other gospel stories we will hear in Advent have to do with you know, bridesmaids trimming their wicks and maintaining their oil. Um, we will have uh, stories of, of um, uh, 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 the Lord coming as a thief in the night, um, surprising the world by, by his return. Um, uh, we will we'll hear, as we did today in today's Thessalonians, um, an uh, encouragement to readiness. Um, uh, the gospel um, uh, uh, today about the talent, um, uh, the parable of the talents, being prepared, um, being ready for when the master of the house returns, that we need to be ready. So anticipation, preparation, and readiness is also tied up kind of with that theme of judgment and repentance, but sort of stands alone um, that we are invited by, um, by God during this season to get ready again, and not just ready for Christmas, like making sure there's gifts under the tree for everybody, getting ready for God's return into the world when we will stand in the presence of God and answer for um, our lives. Lastly, it's the theme of darkness and light, okay? In Advent, um, we really play with this metaphor of darkness and light. Um, and it is woven in the readings. Um, it is woven in our prayers. Um, at, even as it is mirrored in, um, in uh, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, um, the reality we experience every day. As darkness is lengthening, light is shortening um, the hours of daylight, and yet we are invited in Advent to remember um, the way that we are not people of darkness, we are people of light, and that the light, um, the darkness cannot overcome the light as we hear in John's prologue. So this play of the conflict or the tension between darkness and light is very much present in Advent. And we will see that also in, um, as, a, as a core theme in A Christmas Carol. But if you want really to hold on to all these themes in one sort of um, uh, expression, it is in the first collect, the collect for first advent, um, which deserves praying repeatedly. And uh, uh, Rebecca will be leading a class exploring the collects of advent. So if you would like to do more work with this, um, in prayerful meditation or contemplation, uh, join that class as well as we get into Advent, this and the other collects of Advent. But this one in particular for, for, for the first Sunday of Advent sums up all these themes, I think, quite eloquently and poignantly. It's a very ancient collect. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness 
and put on the armor of light. Now, in the time of this mortal life, in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 So, there's just a little foundation laying um, uh, theologically, uh, seasonally, ecclesiastically, um, and, uh, and hopefully a helpful um, table setting. Now we're going to hear from um, Bob. Dr. Patton is going to uh, lead us in a little bit of backstory on Dickens uh, with an S, uh, Dickens um, and his life and what led up to this particular um, novella and just kind of fill in maybe some interesting and important historical detail that can help us understand the story better. And then we'll finish uh, today's session by starting to dive into the first um, stay, the first chapter. Wow. <laughs> I need to reread the carol after that introduction and discover what I should be talking about. Um, I think the second clause uh, in that prayer is of enormous significance now in the time of this life. Uh, Dickens was himself in the 1840s a Unitarian. Uh, he'd been moved by the Unitarians from a very socially conscious uh, sect in, in Boston where Dickens visited in early 1842. And when he came back to England after that visit, he continued to associate with Unitarian preachers. He, he took a pew for a decade in a Unitarian church. And what was particularly of interest to him was what one did in this life. Um, he was less concerned with the, the book of Revelation and other things about the life hereafter and very much concerned about the, the way the new industrial world was um, disfiguring uh, so much of life. In the, in the late 1830s, there was a terrible mining disaster. They happened all the time. It was just a collateral damage, but 28 children were killed. And this was the first year of Queen Victoria's reign. She was 18, 19 years old. And she said, I want an inquiry into why so many children died. Mm -hmm. And that set up a process from, the, from 1829 to 18, uh, 1839 to 1843, 44, of parliamentary investigations about what, uh, what people were experiencing in the mines and manufactories of early industrial England. And the results of those inquiries, which were done on good utilitarian and, and Unitarian principles. Unitarians believed that reason could understand the works of God. You didn't need magic to understand them. Uh, and uh, the, they, they, they set up an, a system of inquiry that interviewed all sorts of people. I mean, you get an eight-year-old girl telling what it is like to sit in a, in a stand in a cold, damp mine for 12 or 14 hours a day, opening and shutting a door with no toilet facilities, no food, no company, no conversation, no light. One of the things she said is she hates not having any light. And well, the kindest thing a miner would do is give her a, a, a candle just as it was guttering out and she had light for a few minutes. And Dickens was furious about all of this kind of, of uh, damage that was being done on families and particularly on God's children. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to address himself in particular to the moral and religious consequences of the kinds of lives those workers' children were facing. There was no educational program. And when the various churches, Protestant and Catholic and nonconformist, would try to be engaged together in some program of, of uh, teaching, they, they'd fall to pieces over various tiny points of, of, of sectarian difference. Mm -hmm. um, just, I mean, the most important sectarian difference was just exactly what constituted the host and the communion mm -hmm. among various sects. So Dickens tried to avoid that. He was writing in the 1840s for his children, A Life of Our Lord. 
uh, and he was teaching it to them at night. And so he did a version of the New Testament, which is uh, in some ways very simple-minded and in some ways brilliant in avoiding the sectarian differences between this and that. Um, and so the Christmas Carol is part of that exercise. Um, he, he was also broke. Uh, he had borrowed a lot of money in order to take a year off after eight years of furious writing. And then typical of Dickens, he decided he would go to America for six months on a terrible Atlantic crossing in the middle of a storm and the water came over the ship. They thought they were gonna drown. It was just a fierce Cunard limer with a steam ship. And it was a terrible voyage over and then a very wonderful visit in America. But he was very upset about slavery uh, and, and uh, went into it at some length and came home and wrote a book called American Notes about his time in America. And he was very disillusioned with America. It was uh, a real problem for him to think about the promise of America and what he saw when he got there. So that was in his mind. And he was also writing a book called Martin Chuzzlewit about the Chuzzlewit family who from time immemorial, the first chapter begins with Adam and Eve and traces the Chuzzlewit family thereafter. They are prideful, they believe that they own and are entitled to the universe and they, they spread that gospel everywhere. And they're also financiers and misers and uh, really bad dudes in a lot of ways. And he, he had promised various uh, newspaper proprietors that he would write some kind of hammer blow about the conditions in mines and manufactories. And he never got around to it. It, it. it turned out that the reports that were coming from parliament couldn't be released until they were laid on the floor of the House of Commons. And so things had gotten you know, slowed down in the usual legislative process, which we in America know nothing about. Uh, and uh, so he eventually just carved a few weeks out of the time of writing this serial, which had to be composed, Martin Schulzewit, in the first 15 days of every month. So his illustrator would know what prints to make and the proofs could come to him at the end of the month and that would be issued on the last Saturday of the month. But he managed to carve two or three weeks out, got in touch with an illustrator who had been wanting to illustrate his work for a long time and who was a principal illustrator in a new comic magazine called Punch. Uh, and got him to do some pictures to accompany this, this story. And everything he was worried about just kind of flowed in. Some of us may have had a wonderful experience of thinking about a subject for a long time. And all of a sudden, a couple of days come when you can sit down and write about it, write about it for a sermon or class. And, and everything comes together, even more than you knew that you had in your head. And that product was a carol. Uh, which uh, I've been teaching and reading and I've performed countless fundraisers actually of bringing in the plum pudding and the Cratchit Christmas. I raised a few hundred dollars for a library now and then. Um, but it's such a, and, and I'm afraid all my talking is going to do lousy things to the, to the emotion of that carol. The, um, even the first stay with its description of the cold, of Ways. Dickens's invention, the, the winters in the 1840s when the Christmas Carol was written in 1843 were rather warm uh, and he didn't know many snowy Christmases but it's a part of this light dark duality that, that, that just floods everything about the Carol because um, Scrooge is a man who's, who's got a, a freezing, a sub a minus centigrade temperature about him and he freezes everybody he goes around and it's a part of that conservation and clutching and grasping that is characteristic of a whole group of really socially concerned philosophers and theologians of the period that the world's resources were inadequate to feed and support an enlarging population because food supplies and other such things 
grew at best at an arithmetic rate, you know, one to two to three to four. But depending on the amount of arable land and what could be harvested and what could be delivered and good years and bad, but population increased geometrically. I mean, if two people have four kids and four kids then have each four kids a piece, all of a sudden, boom, you're growing up and putting stresses on the land. And if the pie is constant, then we can't have anything take a piece of that pie without it impoverishing everybody else. So there, there was this uh, pretty widespread among economists at the time notion that um, we, we had to keep the poor uh, within the confines of their uh, economic capacity. Wait until you marry, until you can have children, until you have enough money and have saved enough. Um, large families were a characteristic of well-to-do families. If you want one horrible statistic, uh, some of you may know Edward Lear and his, his limericks. Uh, he was also a beautiful watercolor uh, painter. He was the 21st child of the same mother and father. And after Lear, his mother died and his father had three more children. And they were raised by nannies and things. You know, you didn't have to do much to have a child in, in those days if you were rich, if somebody else took care of them. So the lesson for the poor was stay in your station until you're productive enough to add to that pie in a minuscule way. And uh, then you can have a bit. And the leading economist magazine, when the Christmas Carol was published, had an anonymous review that just excoriated uh, the gift of the turkey to the Cratchits in the Christmas in the fifth stave, because some family had to go without so that that resource could be made available in excess to a family of the poor who didn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of issues. And particularly for Dickens, he was worried about the fact that the children having no education had no moral instruction at all. And he said, if you tried to ask them in a ragged school in London, you know, what, what faith means or, or why Christ came on earth, they had absolutely no idea in the world. I don't know how he came to be. I don't know who he was or when he came. And one minor's child said, but I know he had a stone pillow for his head and that's more than I've got. So uh, the, 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 the degree of lack that infuriated Dickens and the degree of complacency of the people who had enough, uh, is one of the things that drove his spirit. Mm. Okay, somebody else talk. <laughs> Maybe about, uh, there, there is one other issue that raised by Father Casey's uh, introduction that I think we might think about a bit. The first stave has two parts. It, it's Scrooge in the counting house and everything that stands for it is freezing cold and there's one coal burning and there's this clerk, Bob Cratchit, who makes 15 bob a week, 15 shillings a week to raise a huge family. Dickens couldn't survive when he was 12 years old with a house already paid for on seven shillings a week, which was half of that. He, he ate it up before the end of the week. How you did twice that for a family of six, you know, very hard to imagine. Um, but the other half of it is this ghost that visits. And Dickens called it a Christmas carol or a little ghost story. And ghosts have many different characteristics. They're very common in fairy tales and other kinds of things that sort of speak to the crossing of the divine or the godly or the non-material world with the human world. And um, Marley is a particularly odd kind of example. He's coming back seven years after Scrooge, after he died, when he died on Christmas Eve. So it, 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 what we have in the first day is Christmas Eve is a time of death. Uh, Marley died seven years ago. This is the anniversary of Marley's death. Marley was dead to begin with. I mean, that's how the book opened and how you can write anything after that, unless it's a body in the library kind of story, it's, it's hard to understand. But Marley even gets a life after death, which was not really, uh, somebody like Roy is gonna tell us more about this, I hope, 
it's not really a part of uh, Protestant theology. Mm -hmm. There is no, you know, time for negotiating between death and your destination in, mm -hmm. in the afterlife. But Marley seems to be there. He says he's traveled for seven mm -hmm. years endlessly. He gives a slight odor of having just come out of an oven uh, and there's a sort of breeze around him all the time. So the warmth, well, he's clearly not in the pit of hell with brimstone and mortar falling all over him, but he seems to have a chance and a hope uh, for Scrooge to live a better life in this time of preparation. And Marley's been somehow or other enabled to come and visit Scrooge and pass through doors and things as he passes through the that, that, that terrible, terrible transept between our human life and what comes after. And he's able to move through all such barriers to come to Scrooge and give him this gift of life. And what the gift is, is a gift of time. Mm -hmm. Whether that's purgatory in the Christian Dantean sense uh, the, a, a great Anglican priest of the period was, was preaching a lot about purgatory, but John Henry became Roman Catholic in 1846 and uh, became uh, very much then adopting uh, the, the message of purgatory. But there's something about what um, Marley comes to stand for, that if Scrooge can change his way of life now in preparation, in Advent, mm -hmm. repent and go forward, he might have a very different uh, experience. And whether that would count for Marley in his life is something we never quite know, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's there. So it's fascinating that the gift that Marley gives Scrooge is time, mm -hmm. the past, the present, and the future, exactly. Yeah of advent excellent roy jump in oh my goodness uh, what a feast um <laughs> talk about talk about a a goose this was this was the whole thing um so many things i mean everything uh, talking about the uh, the mine accident and the ragged school and all of this i i, I wrote to rebecca mother rebecca this week and i told her um because I, I, I was, I wanted to give her like a, a, a section or something, one of my favorite things. In fact, it very well may be that my favorite section of A Christmas Carol is only three sentences. Um, and it's, and it's, let me just, I have a copy of it right here. And it's on the very first page, in fact. Um, and it's, um, it's um, this, uh, the mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. Yep, there it is right there. Um, right, nothing, yeah. So this must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm, I am going to relate. For me, at least, that's my favorite thing because the, 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 the sense of the story, the purpose of the story, the goal of the story is, in fact, not found within the story. The purpose of the story is found in reforming the ragged school. The purpose mm -hmm. of the story is found in working to change the lives of those miners. The purpose of the story, right, because he was supposed to be writing some pamphlet or something about social conditions, but in fact, what he writes is this story. And so this story is supposed to take the place of that and actually cause, cause change in that society. And for me, at least being a postmodern reader, right? It's not, only, it's not only the ragged school that needs to be reformed and it's not only those minds that need to be reformed and it's not only the poor houses and the prisons and the, and the treadmill. And it's not all, all of that that needs to be reformed. In fact, the, the, the real purpose of the story is in fact not found just in that. It's found actually in the life of the reader, whoever the reader is. At the, it's, it's that by the end of the story, it's not, it's not just it's not just that Scrooge has a change of life. He has a change of heart. He, he, is, he is in a sense a different person. 
right? At the very beginning, it's Scrooge and Marley, Marley and Scrooge, but it didn't matter to Scrooge because he answered to either. He doesn't, he's not even, a, he doesn't have a self. But by the end of it, there was no one that, that celebrated it better, right? Than, than Scrooge. By the end, he has a self, he, he's been re, in a sense, right? In a good John three sense, right? He's been reborn, he's a, he's a new person. And it seems to me that, that the real, the, the wonderful thing that can come from this story is in fact, not just sort of being entertained, um, but it's in fact finding that, that, that new life in ourselves, um, maybe seeing things we didn't see before, um, I mean, hopefully we don't, well, in a sense, though, we do have three spirits come to us as well, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we actually see these things. We actually see Scrooge. Um, and maybe um, that, that change can actually occur in our own hearts. And I think that that's the best Advent lesson ever. Um. I, uh, I read um, I, I, my wife's grandfather's copy, which is an annotated Christmas carol. Um, oh, yeah. And the, in the introduction of it... Um, uh, uh, was written by the editor who about Bob may know, um, Michael Patrick Hearn. Yes. And in it, Roy, he writes exactly about this. He's writing about some of the critiques that Bob just referenced um, about like the, um, you know, uh, the Cratchit family having the, the turkey. And uh, mm. there's like contemporary critiques at the Cratchits and like the um there's all these economics cr economic critiques of and social critiques of the story and how flawed it is but um hern writes in the in the preface to this annotated version um it is scrooge not cratchit who must change uh dickens means towards economic reform is to change the individual who is the cause of the unjust system not the system itself it is psychological, not political. Yes. Evidently, Dickens saw no need to change the structure of society before there were better people to live in it. It's this um, internal transformation. And, and um, we can talk about contemporary overlays of this and whether you have to and change I, arts and, before you change structures. And but I hope we do, <laughs> but, eventually, and, yeah. Yes, I mean, you, you must do both. And I don't think anyone would say, you know, all we need to do is just go around to individuals changing their hearts rather than break down systems of injustice. But there is a strong case to be made, at least in this story, for the internal transformation of heart, as you describe it, Roy, so perfectly, that must happen. And as, the, um, as this editor writes, so that um, so that there are better people who can live in to that more just structure. I think uh, Marx was in England. Engels was in England. Both of them understood the Industrial Revolution in terms of the Midland manufactories that both families from Germany were were a part of, and the real understanding of the systematic structures that it oppressed the workers came just in the beginning in the late 1860s and the New York Herald Tribune said, we can't wait to see what Mr. Marx is going to tell us about what we should change. I mean, it was going to be received wonderfully in lots of quarters. Um, and so you're right, Father Casey, that, that, that this, this change is, is individual and there has to be a social change, but it's embedded in the language. Scrooge's name was good upon apostrophe change or anything he put his hand to. And so the change that Scrooge is good for is business. And it's mm -hmm. business in all those ways of hoarding and keeping and not sharing, paying your taxes and sending people to the, you know, to the, uh, my screen suddenly changed the text to correct me, but <laughs> and it's, that's right. It's totally right. Yep. That kind of change, whereas especially what Scrooge needs to do is to experience the spiritual change. Mm -hmm. And it's not that he's completely transformed because at the very beginning is a lonely, lonely boy, which I will get to in a couple of weeks, uh, at the beginning of the second stave, he's, he's a lonely boy. And um, he has some good qualities. And there is even in this story, the sense that the world shapes Scrooge into the worship of a golden idol. And so Freud loved Dickens and gave Martha Bernays, his, his fiance, 
a copy of David Copperfield, which Dickens began writing as soon as he finished the last of the Christmas stories. Oh. And Freud said, Dickens writes such wonderful characters because he said, while they are sinful, they are not frightening and mean. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is that capacity to see the good uh, and the possibility of change, spiritual change, personal change in every human being that I think endears us to Dickens. He, he wrote in a letter uh, that people haven't quoted enough. He said, there is some hunchbacked goodness in everyone. Mm. Now, he may have been thinking of Richard III, but what a wonderful <laughs> phrase. And I, I'm sure that all those who were working on disability uh, studies would find this rude, but, but it's, mm. it's a way of saying we have to find in everything mm -hmm. where that seed of goodness is to change, not by going into the marketplace to gain material things, mm -hmm. but to mm -hmm. change the spiritual construction of the world. So that's the kind of, it's not the Marxist so much as it is the sort of sense of the connection between the spiritual and the, the, the material. One of the things that fascinated me, and, and you touched on it when you were talking about the gift that Marley gives is the gift of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the in that time, Scrooge as an individual does go through this transformation, this utter change you know, I, I will, what is it that the prophets say that the Lord will take out your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, right? Um, the change takes place. He, he gets the gift of three full days in one night, which has, which to me has huge connotations about Christ being in the tomb. That nice. is in essence, what he's get, the gift is the gift of time in the tomb to experience his own personal resurrection to new mm. life. That's beautiful. Mm. Uh, that's beautiful. Uh, wow, that's so good. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yes. thank you. Um, but but uh, but what a gift! I mean, how, yeah. how many of us would would benefit yeah. tremendously from something like that? Yeah. The gift of three nights in a tomb so that we can resurrect. I've only read stave one. You just ruined the ending. How dare <laughs> you? Sorry. Oh, but <laughs> the side -back <laughs> Here's the other thing I found very interesting, just to switch to something maybe a little lighter. We do not learn the names of anyone other than Scrooge and Marley in Stave One. If unless I'm very much mistaken, but as we listened, uh, Cratchit is not named. He's just referred oh. to as the clerk. Oh, interesting. His no. nephew. Fred is not named. No, he is Fred only is not referred named. to as his nephew. That's nice. We don't learn any names of anyone. And probably that's because, I mean, I don't know if this was Dickens' intent. The effect of that on me was to become a little bit like Scrooge in that first stave. But mm. I don't think he cares what their names are. He isn't no. paying attention to anyone other than himself. So, and in fact, even himself, even himself is not Scrooge or Marley or Scrooge, Scrooge or Marley. It doesn't really, it doesn't, they're, they're the same person, right? They are. They he are. incorporated. That's right. Both bodies. And it was just about the time that we began trying to figure out how a group of people could become an individual in the laws of the 19th century. That's right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But it's, you know, incorporate into the body of. Uh, I was I was just talking to Amy about this this morning, my wife Amy, um, and that is it, it, it's it's really funny is that it's because when, when the when um, Marley first shows up, um, Scrooge doesn't believe it, right? I could swallow this toothpick, you know. The, you, you're there's more gravy than grave, you know, as far as you know, it's for you, right? But it's like once <laughs> once he once he recognizes that it actually is Marley. There, it's it the, the whole story. His whole demeanor changes because yeah. it's 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 because he's seeing himself, right? And quite literally, right? Um, although uh, Scrooge's uh, chains are seven years longer than Marley's are now, um, but it, yeah, I love that. I love that, Rebecca. That's beautiful. I had not noticed that. Mm -hmm. And and it's the same way that that people treat human beings in the abstract by, by sort of summing them all up. So it's charity solicitors. It's not 
Bill and Peter who are down the street, a butcher and a candle maker. It's just, they're a function. And uh, part of the rational for way of doing economics in the 19th century was to find out what would be, to, uh, what kind of legislation would produce the greatest good for the greatest number. And you gross that all up and that is your policy. But of course we know the greatest number uh, to begin with uh, excluded half the world because men were the only ones whose greater good was solicited. And you're certainly not soliciting the greater good of Bob Cratchit. You want what the politicians and the great landowners want. And so if you build this calculus, which is rational on a kind of survey that he faces the individual with all their different names, um, you've got something that's already uh, not human. Uh, and that's one of the things that the, the subcommissioners doing these investigations for parliament were so wonderful. They interviewed individual minors, minors children's, they gave their first names. Yeah. And of course, people didn't believe that at all. They said that was all phony, this was fake news, uh, not, not really to be believed at all. It, it Dickens always wanted the individual, mm -hmm. to, that individual voice to be heard. There was something of value to every single one. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. I, uh, I have been thinking a lot this last week about um, uh, uh, the interchange between Scrooge and Marley, right at that moment, Roy, that you were describing when, when Scrooge finally starts to believe that Marley, that this is Thank real. You. And, um, and, and he says, um, speak comfort to me, Marley. He implores him, first he's dismissive. And, and, and I love, Scrooge is filled with humor. I mean, he's just so funny. Um, so he's very mean spirited, but he's also hilarious. So he's been super dismissive, more grave, more gravy than grave. And then, and then when he finally crashes down on him that this is real, he implores Marley to speak comfort to him. Um, and, Something about that reminds me of the of the story in Luke's gospel of, of the of Lazarus and the rich man, and um, and and the great it's a parable it's a parable that's only appears in Luke's gospel of uh, a rich man who dismissed the um, d desperate um, uh, uh, need um, and despair of of the beggar at his at his doorstep um, for so long, and then they both die, and and um, uh, the the a beggar is um, re reclining at the bosom of Abraham and the, and the rich man who had been dismissive of this man's desperate need is in torment. And he asks um, Abraham to send, uh, so he, he's, he's asking the, 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 for the beggar's help and um, uh, send, send him back to give, you know, to, to tell people about it. Something about that exchange of send him back to tell other people about it really just strikes me here. But this moment of like, give me good news also is tied up in this as well. Um, speak comfort to me. But it's the comfort of, um, it's the kind of the comfort of Isaiah in chapter 40. Comfort, oh, comfort my people. And then you get what the comfort is. And it's all people are grass. And it's like, wait, that's not, I'm so that wasn't the, that wasn't the comfort I was that's thinking right. you were going to give me. Right. Um, uh, because Marley is like, you know, your business was the business of mankind. I mean, Scrooge wants Marley to tell him everything he's done is good and that keep it up and the business, whatever. And he's like, no, your business is completely upside down wrong. Right. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about Isaiah 40 and, and Lazarus and the rich man as it sort of um, is present or um, uh, those themes are present in the exchange between Scrooge and Marley. And somehow Marley is there because of his own, right? And again, I was trying to find it, but of your own, my, of my own procuring, there is something that has happened in the past exactly. seven years that, that Marley is now, and again, Marley, if he cares about anybody in the world, it must be about Scrooge. Um, and it's, it's whatever's, whatever salvation, whatever rebirth Scrooge is going to experience, it's because Marley has procured it. And so it's almost as if we take that Lazarus and rich man and actually play it out. What would happen if, yeah. yeah. And if Marley and Scrooge have incorporated, then maybe 
it's Marley that's been working in Scrooge for seven years. Although Scrooge continues to ask for comfort in the, in the fourth stave, you know, when he's looking at the grave and this dead body, he says, well, show me a seed of some comfort. And what he showed is that if that person is dead and this couple owed him money, the time it will take to transfer the debt will allow them to pay off. So the death is the greatest gift you could have. Exactly. exactly. It's, comfort. it's beautifully <laughs> ironic. Yeah. yeah. There is there, there is something about this, um, you know, wanting uh, Scrooge wanting words of comfort before mm -hmm. any actual. I mean, it would be so premature if Marley had just, you know, obviously it would have been premature to the, the to the beauty of the story. It would have ended at stave one instead of five staves, but premature to the act of personal transformation. There has to be the full truth telling. There has to be the full like background delving before there is actually an impossibility of, of transformation. But I am so aware of my own and I think our human um, uh, uh, instinct to want to jump straight to the, give me the good news. Don't make me, don't make me go through all the hard stuff. Um, give me straight to the good news. And, and I was thinking about that specifically because we just did this history of racism, this six week class exploring racism. And in the very first class, literally in the very first class, all these people are asking, but what are we supposed to do? What's the good news? And it's like, y'all, we haven't even started. You, we can't like jump to the good news until we have actually told the history. Right. Only then can you actually possibly have the capacity to know what kind of transformation is necessary. Mm -hmm. And here Scrooge is just modeling that, that just complete human instinct mm -hmm. to want to get to the, get to the good part before you've done any of the work. It's really interesting. Most of the time when I, when I work, I read most other things in light of the Old Testament, right? So because of what I do. So I know the Old Testament and then I look at other things in light of the Old Testament because I've been spending so much time with the Christmas carol. I'm starting to look at scripture through a Christmas carol. Ah, nice. <laughs> but no, this is awesome. This is awesome. This morning, right? The reading from Zephaniah. My God, that's scary stuff, yeah. right? I mean, and it's like, it, it's a picture of God's coming again and their wealth won't save them and complete destruction and there'll be blood in the streets. And it's, and it suddenly struck me that it's like listening to Zephaniah through a Christmas carol. It's actually rather hopeful. It's not destructive. It's looking at that, that chapter that stay for yeah. looking at that death, looking on that tombstone and not knowing whose name is there and strongly suspecting, I know whose name is there. That's what causes. And so even hearing that horrific oracle of Zephaniah this morning, it was like, you know what, actually, if I actually accept that, if I actually hear that, it could actually be good news. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's really, it was really transformative. I'm sorry to interrupt, Bob, you were going to say something. No, no, else. All no. I was going to say is Marley's response to, to asking for those words of comfort, it's not in his power. It's not going to come down right away. Just, hey, you've asked right. and I've given, you know. That's right. It's got to be the change. It and I really like that. the idea of that maybe, uh, you know, Marley's been watching out for Scrooge for seven right. years. And it's a right. bit, uh, yeah. as we believe, we are looked out after, That's even right. in our right. worst times. But I just I just love the scene where, where Marley tells him, this is the gift I'm going to give you. And Scrooge's response is, yeah. I think I'd rather not. <laughs> And after he says it, no, I really don't think I want that, right? Like he's, he's just looking the gift horse in the mouth. I, I think I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> then, then he says, you know, without their visits, of course, you can't, you, you can't receive the gift. And he says, well, can I take them all at once and have it over? Yeah. Right. You know, <laughs> that's right. And, and that's, it's that same human tendency. Carol uh, Fraunheim in the chat says he wants, Scrooge wants the bottom line, mm. which is such a great observation, Carol. That's, right. that's exactly what he wants. And it's, we want to put distance between ourselves and Scrooge. We want to think that's not us, but it is us. And, and Father Casey's example from, from our class with Dr. Waters is, is spot on. It is so hard to go through and to look deeply into the pain that we have caused in the world, mm -hmm. that we want to just rush through that and say, well, let me fix it. Mm -hmm. But what 
what has to happen is that we have to change within before any change mm -hmm. can happen outside. It's that same thing we've been talking about, Bob, that Dickens is interested in individual personal change mm -hmm. that then can affect change in the and one of, And one of the ways that, for me at least, one of the ways, and it's a theme that I think works all the way through, um, because it's, yes, he's, Scrooge is given the gift of time, right? Past, present, and future. But in what that means, what that actually means is learning things you didn't know and being able to see things that you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, sort of the, the knowledge, there's the, there's, the, um, there's the line that had always, had long bothered me um, when, the, um, when the, the two men come in for uh, trying, to, trying to get some um, money for, um, uh, for the poor and, um, and Scrooge says, um, excuse me, if you're looking for it, Rebecca, um, give me a word. I can put it up. Yeah. He says, excuse me. Here it is. Okay. Um, many, there, many can't go. So, so I thought that they were, you know, many can't go there and many had rather die. If they had rather die, Scrooge said, they better do it. And decrease the surplus population, which is this Malthusian type of thing that you know there's only so much. So they better decrease the po surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. And that had always it had always bothered me that that last sentence. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. The way it struck me this time reading it through was that you see Scrooge doesn't want to know. He doesn't yeah. want to know what's happening in the mines. He doesn't want to know what's happening with the children. He doesn't want to know, but he does know, but he doesn't want to know. And so he starts talking about, well, well, you know, they better do it and decrease it. Besides, oh, excuse me, I don't know that. It's mm -hmm. almost as if he's talking to himself that he wants to push that knowledge out because if he knows things, then he becomes not just responsible for things, but they, those things actually start affecting him. And it wow. seems to me that's one of the things that happens throughout the, the next three, three staves is that he starts learning things that he might have known, mm -hmm. but he had forgotten, mm -hmm. starting with yeah, his childhood. Well, you might have known it. That's right. Look, that's right. Look what happens. It's not yeah. my business. You know that's what, that's what, what he says. says. It's not my business, says Scrooge. That's right. And then in comes Marley, who says, oh, yes, it is. That's right. <laughs> it, well, it is your that's only that's business. God. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and and we do have that tendency to feel that that our own two hundred year history is is not our business. Why should we we be worrying about that? It's not our business. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't me oh. personally, even if it's my history, I didn't do it, so it's not my fault. I don't need to worry about that. That's right. right. <laughs> Dr. Heller, uh, uh, Elaine uh, Culver has has uh, noted that all of this conversation is drawing her back to your classes and your discussions of oh, shooting, that's sweet. yeah, to shoe to turn around. I'm yeah. aware that we have reached the end of our hour for today, oh. um, but we have just begun to um, to to get into this, and it's marvelous, um, which let's, is a reminder. Of, let's spend of the next, Let's spend the next five weeks just on stave one. That's <laughs> always, <laughs> there's no good ending, but I will add, it, it, let, let me just say one thing to lighten our mood here, that it is true that we learn from pain, but not in this book. All of the lessons are Scrooge missing out on the joy and happiness mm -hmm. of mm. others. And even when he sees death, he doesn't have the same re relationship as the family that suffers that. So it's it's interesting. Mm -hmm. that, that's mm -hmm. such you guys are so great. I, I don't have anything to add except yeah. <laughs> Dickens yeah. has lots to add. That's right. Yeah. For those so, who are. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say briefly for those who are wondering, as I was when we were listening on our way down, why they're called staves. Uh, Father Casey briefly mentioned this, but a stave is a is a musical uh, bar, um, and so given that it is a Christmas carol, that this is something that is being sung to us in a sense. Uh, Dickens chooses to use that term from music to describe the chapters within the book. So that wasn't familiar to me before I really dug well, into it last week. Just add one thing. There mm -hmm. are five lines and four spaces in a stave. 
there are five, there are five uh, chapters, as it were, staves, but all the implication lies in the blank between the lines. Ah, yeah. And that's our job. <laughs> yeah, nice. And, and the book is called A Christmas Carol. The phrase Christian Carol, only, I think only appears throughout the whole thing once. And it appears in stave one. And it has to do with this little boy who's gonna be important next week. Mm -hmm. uh, but this little boy who's, who's, who stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christian Carol. But at the first sound of, and just notice, not God rest ye merry gentle men, it's God bless you, merry, gentle man. May nothing you dismay. Oof. But Scrooge picks up the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congenial frost. And so pay attention to that little boy because he's going to pop up next week. Um, so. And the ruler is exactly that heartless measure of everything. Mm. Oh. I mean, you know, and now we're <laughs> going to talk about the connecting ants and ors. <laughs> oh my gosh. Be, yeah. So friends, we will meet again in two weeks time. And one of the designs of, of that break, just one week after we begin, was that we hoped what has happened with us here has happened with all of you, that we have uh, given you an appetite for the carol and that you now have two weeks to sort of get ready. So if you haven't yet read stave one, you've got two more weeks before we get back together to do that and to read stave two. If you do the audiobook, you could listen to the whole thing and then go back with a text and, and go through it more slowly, uh, which should do that. Should really help. Um, because you'll get the over it's, it's just like it's just like my old testament professor used to tell me all the time in seminary that you should sit and read the whole book in one sitting and then you can go back and dig in so um, maybe do that <laughs> and particularly with something like this i have found this time there's not a single paragraph that's not important that's right. every everything fits i mean it's beautiful yeah great y'all right. right. so we'll Thank see you, you uh, see you all in two weeks time uh, God bless and keep you all, and uh, we'll see you soon. God, God bless us, everyone. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> you've been waiting. You've been waiting for an hour to say that. I have. <laughs> bye, friends. <laughs> all right. Bye, bye. <laughs>